Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Welcome to Berkeley Arts and Design Monday Talks. My name is Lisa Wymore, and I'm the faculty advisor for Berkeley Arts and Design, which is as part of the Discovery Initiative uh, here at Berkeley. Berkeley Arts and Design connects and fortifies creative departments and units throughout the Berkeley campus. And funds for these talks are made possible by generous philanthropic, philanthropic donations to Berkeley Arts and Design. Unique to the speaker series is its connection to a course called Humanities 20, which is offered through the Division of Arts and Humanities. 50 students are enrolled in the class. Welcome class. I'm so glad that you're here. And um, they attend the weekly talks. The, um, this semester's theme is perseverance, renewal, and reflection. So welcome all to uh, the public as well, which is invited to these talks. And tonight's event is entitled Shimon Ati, Looking Back at Night Watch, a floating media arts installation that activated and animated the San Francisco Bay. And I want to give special thanks to our partners, to Catherine Clark and the nonprofit Box Blur, which has a focus on the intersection of performance and visual arts, and also to uh, the Immersive Arts Alliance. Shimon Addy is an internationally renowned visual artist, and we are so excited to have him uh, here. His artistic practice includes creating site-specific installations in public places, accompanying art photographs, immersive multimedia, uh, multiple channel video, um, and mixed media installations for museums and galleries and um, new media works. For two decades, Shimon Addy has made art that allows us to reflect on the relationship between place, memory, and identity. In many of his projects, he engages local communities in finding new ways of representing their history, memory, and potential futures, and explores how contemporary media may be used to reimagine new relationships between space, time, place, and identity. He is particularly concerned with issues of loss, communal trauma, and the potential for regeneration. So it really fits, your work really fits into our theme this year. Um, Addy's work has been shown in group and solo exhibitions in museums and galleries around the world, including the Museum of Modern Art New York, um, the Center Georges Pompidou in Paris, the, the Miami Art Museum, um, the National Gallery of Art, among many others. Um, five commercial monographs have been published on Shimon Addy's work, which have been subject to several films, aired at PBS, BBC, and ARD. Um, Ati's work has received, uh, he's received many artistic fellowships, including a Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and the American Academy of Rome, uh, the Rome Prize, the National Endowment for the Arts, um, and many others. In 2013 and 14, Ati was awarded the Lee Krasner Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, Shimon was born in Los Angeles, California, and now lives and works out of New York City. He received, um, he's an alum of UC Berkeley. Uh, and has an MFA degree from San Francisco State University, uh, which he received in 1991. And since that time, he has um, received more than 25 commissions to create new works of art um, in more than 10 countries around the world. So we're excited to have Shimon here. Before we begin, I want to recognize that UC Berkeley is located in the territory of Huichin, the ancestral and unceded lands of of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County and the confederated villages of Lashan. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. The history of prolific artistic and technological development in this region has always depended on this land. Berkeley Arts and Design is um, committed to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity in relationship with tribal elders and organizations. Um, also want to mention that there will be closed captioning for this event. You can find that down at the bottom bar of your webinar. If you have problems accessing this or have other access issues, please put that in the chat. And then um, my final little bit of housekeeping here will be to say that if we hope, we encourage you to ask questions, we should have a nice question and answer period after Shimon does a presentation. Um, so please put those in the Q&A rather than the chat. 
And um, with all that said, I would like to introduce Shimon Ati. So let's begin. Hi there. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight. And Lisa, thank you for such a lovely introduction. And also thank you to Berkeley Arts and Design for inviting me to be part of your series uh, this semester. Uh, when we first spoke uh, about my talk tonight, Lisa had mentioned the importance of community engagement and projects that uh, uh, in which the community is, is sort of front and center. Uh, and so my talk today, because I, I probably realized about 35 projects since, since I got my MFA. I won't say what year that was, although Lisa might have said that, um, as one doesn't want to date oneself uh, when it's not necessary. But anyway, um, so I probably selected maybe five, maybe six or seven projects to share with you tonight, thinking about community engagement through the frame of community engagement and also through the frame of looking back at Nightwatch. Uh, I gave se several talks in the Bay Area. Uh, maybe about a month ago or a few weeks ago when Nightwatch was in the Bay. Uh, and this is the first one looking back after the, after the fact and reflecting on it in the rear view mirror. So it's also very special in that way. So without further ado, let us do screen share. We got this done. We're gonna do that one. We're gonna share my screen. And here we go. Um, I can't do a presentation on my work without without always starting with my my first project out of art school, the writing on the wall, because it was it was sort of seminal for me and sort of the beginning of a much longer arc. It's a project that I did in, in one of Berlin's former Jewish quarters. This was in 1991. Uh, so it wasn't that long after the wall came down. This project was in East Berlin. And what you're seeing is a color photograph of a building in East Berlin at that time. East Berlin looks very different now, but, but back, back then this is what it looked like. You're seeing a color photograph of a black and white projection of a Hebrew bookstore that was located right at that address in 1930, exactly there. So it's not a Photoshop, it's not a collage, it's not photo montage. If you're walking down the street, you see the project, you, you turn to the right, you see the projection on the building. You turn to the left, you see me across the street waving at you with my, uh, uh, well, I wanted to say video projectors, but they weren't video projectors back then. They were Kodak, uh, Kodak carousel slide projectors, believe it or not. Me with my projectors, my generator and my camera equipment. Uh, photographing the projections from the past interacting with the architecture of today. So if you see these color images, these photographs in a museum or a gallery, you say, oh, this is photography. If you see them on site, the actual projections, you say, oh, this is site specific installation, or this is installation art, or this is a pub public, like a public project, public art. Um, those kinds of distinctions are not that central in my thinking because I'm someone who believes that ideas can live in more than one form, more than one medium, as long as they do so effectively in each. And these piece, I worked on this project for about a year. This is just, sort of, this is one out of 30, uh, excuse me, 30 installations that I created. And they have very deadpan titles, just the address um, Amstadtstrasse uh, 43 uh, and then colon, slide projection of former Hebrew bookstore, Berlin 1930 comma 1991 or 92, yeah, 92, I think. Um, in the Q&A, if any of you want to ask about what was the responses or reactions of people living in these buildings to seeing these phantom-like projections of former uh, res residents of, of their buildings or businesses that used to be located there, feel free to ask because they were significant uh, oftentimes and very interesting, the responses. Slide projection of former Jewish resident. And the projections typically lasted for one or two evenings. 
And then I would move on to the next site. And I, in art school, which was in San Francisco, I, I came from photography originally. So I was not only thinking about the installations, but also very much thinking about the resulting photographs uh, that would, would exist long after the installations were over. Um, there's a lot of German history <laughs> in some of these images. That, that graffiti on the wall. Now you remember I said East Berlin, that's important, right? So here on the left in the distance, you see this very Orwellian tower that, that's like Berlin Alexanderplatz. It was also the spy center of the former, former East German government. And was der Krieg verschonte, and the whole sentence, this is the graffiti on the building. Was der Krieg verschonte, überlebt in Socialismus nicht. What the war spared did not survive socialism. So I know some of you are uh, young, young compared to me, and the history might seem more distant, but there, there was, you know, there was the pre-war history of Germany, ger German, German pre-war history, which is represented by my slide projection of these former Jewish uh, children. There is the history of the war, which is we know what happened a few years later. Many of the Jewish residents in this neighborhood were sent to death camps. Then we have post-war history. You know, uh, East Germany was a separate government than West Germany. So it was like a social, so-called socialist um, regime. Uh, with the spy center and Stasi, etc. And then you have this graffiti that was put on after the wall came down. It was anti, anti DDR, anti East German government graffiti. What the war spared, what the Second World War spared, did not survive socialism. So many, many layers. Slide projection of former uh, a bookseller, religious bookseller. Slide projection of. Um, former Jewish hat shop with resident. Slide projection of a former Jewish cafe with patrons. That light flare that you're seeing uh, is not from one of my projectors. It was from a street light. I saw it, I could have eliminated it, but I liked it, so I let it be there. Slide projection of former Jewish resident. Slide projection of former Jewish residents. So as you as you know, as we all know, photographs are not masked like this. They, they aren't shaped like this. So I was just using a very small portion of the images. I was using this product that probably doesn't exist anymore uh, called um, Kodak Opaque Slide Paint. And I, I was painting directly on the slides until I got it how I liked it to look. This is with three projections. Now that's sort of my starter because I, 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 I think I've never done an artist talk where I haven't introduced my work with that project because that's where it all began. But now sort of thinking more firmly through the lens of community engagement, I wanna show you um, one of my early community-based artworks called Between Dreams and History in New York City. This was in 1998. Um, it was my, fr I lived in Germany for about six years and then came back to the United States for a variety of reasons, but one of which was to do this project. And I'm just gonna show you a two and a half or three minute clip from the BBC because it sums it up very nicely. In some, in some ways, most wonderfully, when it gets to the synagogue, it's going, it's going Shimon to- Shimon really Atti is preparing to make his mark on Manhattan. Over the last four months, he's talked to residents about their memories of the neighborhood as well as their own stories, superstitions, and dreams. He spent more than two years planning a laser art installation that will take place here in the heart of the Lower East Side, an area influenced by generations of Jewish, Hispanic, and Chinese immigrants. I very much respond to spaces and to places, and by temperament, I'm very interested in memory. Uh, and how, how, do, how do we give visual form to something so, on one hand, so intangible uh, and, and uh, ethereal, but, in something, but on the other hand, something very real for, for us. Shimon found his answer with lasers. Words made of light scroll across the architecture in real time, moving from building to building. Fragments of thoughts, poems, songs are all made visible on the street, some in English, others in Yiddish, Mandarin, or Spanish, the languages of this community. It's a major art project that required a lot of coordination and backing. 
we couldn't imagine a better marriage for public art of really stunning the public with great visuals and providing them with content that was incredibly thoughtful. That's Anne Pasternak, who currently is the director of the Brooklyn Museum. Shimon says that the lasers help Back animate his my project. Sister. The quality of laser light mirrors how memory itself functions. Lasers, they're very uh, intense light, very focused, so they appear to have a presence. And yet, after all, it's just a light source. It's more, much more like a ghostly kind of writing, as if a ghost is writing out of thin air. That's the visual effect that I wanted. This is high-tech public art at its most public. Anybody, it seems, who walks through okay. this neighborhood and sees this art installation ends up staying. What do you get Some of it? the things, you know, are very touching. Like someone saying that they live so poorly in a tenement, you know, and the conditions were so bad. And I know that these people come. This population has uh, grown up in this area and have come from bad times. Now, this is really a wonderful change, the fact that you could display something in art in a very simple form and in a very easy form, I think, and people could, could see it in a very clear and in a, in a very beautiful manner. I think it's wonderful. I think it's going to cause a lot of the people that live in the community to just look differently at the buildings that they, that they live in. For two centuries, this part of Manhattan has been home to many different groups of immigrants. But that's changing as affluent young professionals move in. But Shimon Ati hopes his laser art will help keep the older memories alive. Damien Fowler, BBC News, New York. So you can see how um, I have a long history of working with issues around immigration, um, refugees, asylees, up to and including a night watch, which we'll get to in a few minutes. That piece from the BBC was very good at showing the laser uh, animation technique, the ride out technique that we developed. It's less good at showing the dramatic, the full breadth and, and visual scope of the project because it, it, it encompassed two city blocks in the Lower East Side. I remember when we lived in a tenement on the top floor in very bad condition. It was like a dream, dot, dot, dot. So entire phrases would write themselves out and then sustain for a, a, a moment, maybe 30 seconds, and then unwrite as if they had been written in disappearing ink. And everything was written, um, they, were, they were, I interviewed about 75 residents of the Lower East Side and I asked them a series of questions. And some of them were, we met as individuals, but I often met them as in groups. And I asked them a ser series of questions like, um, have you ever had a sleeping dream about the Lower East Side? If so, please write it down in your first language. Can you remember your favorite nursery rhyme from childhood? If so, can you please write it down in your first language? And these, these memories were proje laser projected both in the, in the first language, which was either Mandarin, Spanish, uh, Yiddish, or English. Uh, the languages of that neighborhood at that time. Uh, and they were also written in English. So this is the English translation from a Chinese poem. I'm going to screw it up. Let's see. I, 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 hmm. Always changing places as one would change clothes. I'm leaving now, but I remember my past as closely as tightly sewn stitches. I used to know all of these phrases by art, but it's been just a few years. Um, most of my community-based projects have documentary films that accompany them that others have made sort of about the making of, and it, and they often include my interactions with, with the participants, um, what they felt about participating, what they felt when they saw the finished artwork, uh, et cetera. This one's a little, this one's, a, this one's more, more intense. It's a, it's a very intense project. Um, I, I'm showing it because it, well, it's it's the, the ultimate form of community engagement in the sense of the challenges and traps of working with communities. You know, not the, the, the easy mistakes that one can make. Um, I don't know if there's any, if we have any British folks in the audience here. If we do, they probably know the history of Aberfan, but most Americans do not. Um, Aberfan was a small coal mining village in the south of Wales that suffered a terrible coal mining related disaster when part of, when some waste products from coal mining 
avalanche down the mountainside, which you could see here, and poured into the village and buried the village's only elementary school, kind of like a Welsh Pompeii. And the village immediately lost almost all of its children because it only had one school. Six children survived because of being lucky, like being in air pockets, but about 120 perished. And it was absolutely devastating. I mean, it's beyond words. It, you know, these are just a few still images from that day. This is a little later, bear, bearing the children. And for 40 years, the, um, the village has, well, now it's 50 years, has been haunted by the worldwide news media. Not only did they lose all of their children or most of their children, but they then, they then, then became a site for disaster tourism and kind of like rubbernecking, voyeurism of disaster. So every major anniversary, the 10 year, the 20 year, the 30 year, the same old, the same documentary films are played on television. Photographs from that day are taken and they feel absolutely haunted by the archive of images around the disaster. And, you know, members of the news media just show up and knock on their door. What was it like to lose your children? I mean, incredibly, uh, intrusive, insensitive, and, and damaging uh, interactions. So I was invited to see if a contemporary artist could do something different uh, on the occasion of the 40 year anniversary since the disaster. And that was technically 2006. Um, the artwork, it took a while to finish the artwork, but but it began in 2006. And for, for a year or two, I, I declined. I said, no, thank you. I was approached by the, by the BBC actually. Um, and I didn't understand that it seemed very off color uh, to me, like why not a Welsh artist? Um, but anyway, there was a long process and they brought me over a few times. I got to meet the villagers and once I understood that I could be as free as I wanted to be, then I was very interested to, to do the project. It was a very difficult project. I had to live in the village for six months um, to gain their trust. And I made them two promises. I, I said, um, it was kind of the opposite of my Berlin project where I, where in a sense you could say, well, I animated the archive or I reactivated the re-engaged, reactivated the archive for my for this project. I promised the villagers I would use absolutely no images from the archive, meaning images of, of the disaster, and that I would show them in ways they've never been seen before. So I created a, a five-channel video installation called The Attraction of Onlookers, Abervan and Anatomy of a Welsh Village. The attraction of onlookers is obviously it's referring to again sort of the 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 fact that we 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 like rubbernecking when we drive by a car accident we look right. Um, this is just a still image from when it was exhibited in the museum in Cardiff. Let me just share a little bit of the piece with you. Now you have to remember you're watching it on a you know a, this is like a dumbed down viewing copy. First, I'm gonna show you one channel and then you'll see a five channels. But remember, it's an, it's an immersive installation in the real and high definition, like 80 feet across. So you're probably watching it like, like at the most one and a half feet across, probably not even like that. So, so you have to use your imagination a little bit, let's see. So it's a viewing copy. This is just one channel. This is the center channel. Life stops for a moment and refuses to stay still. I live in a different time from the world. I see them watching me. Here, not here. Now, not now. And that's a poem that I collaborated with the national poet of Wales, Gwyneth Lewis, whose voice you just heard, to open the piece. 
And again, this is just one of five channels. There's no digital effect. This is not an animation. This is a five foot, eight inch human being standing on a rotating plant holding a static pose. And what I took as my working method basically basically could be summed up as what does it take to make a Welsh village? Every Welsh village has certain types, stereotypes even. And why can Aberfan, this village, not be entitled to the same Welsh tropes and types as any other Welsh village? Rather than always exclusively being associated with the dance with the so she with the disaster. So she's the dancer. She was the dancer. The village saw her as the dancer of the village. She saw herself. This is, you know, every Welsh village has a disaffected teenager who's singing heavy metal in the garage. Um, they, he calls it a hardcore, hardcore singer. He's Abervan's hardcore singer. So they're, he's they're projected lar a bit larger than life size in the population. And in high definition, you see that they're people. You'll see their, you know, the lips might be quivering. You'll see the eyes blink. Um, I I mean, I, I wanted some of those um, gestures and expressions to be present in the people. You see less of that in this small scale viewing copy. This is the ma the mayor. He happens to be one of the six kids who survived the disaster, three of whom are in the art. The viewer doesn't know that unless they're reading on the wall. So the, again, this was a piece while I was making the artwork, the BBC made a documentary for television about the making of the artwork, which goes into all of the community engagement aspects, me living in the village, how I invited people to participate, what their responses were, what their experience of it was, etc. This is the this is the minister. And it's very sectarian. I mean, it's, a, it's a tiny village. I forget. I think there were. I don't even remember how many ministers there, there were in her own church, but a lot. She lost two kids in the disaster. The soundtrack is original. We, we made it for the piece. I mean, um, I, uh, every Welsh village has a boxing. Boxing, like boxing, like male choirs, uh, is very big in Wales. So he's the boxer of, of Aberfan. And again, I was. I, uh, every every Welsh village has a South Asian shopkeeper. So at least so my 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 intention was to create a piece that would allow the village to at least in the realm of the imaginary to be entitled to some of the same Welsh stereotypes as any other village without denying the without denying the history. And the music is quite restrained, but I need to address something which is very important uh, and so substantive, um, which is why did I film them in this way? Why film them as rotating statuary? And I did that for a couple of reasons. Let me switch to the next, sorry, hold on a second. Give me one second here. Okay, now this is the five channel viewing copy, I think. Give me one second, I hope. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, great, great, great. It's gonna cut out of five channels. They get small, but I just want you to see a sense of the scope, rest of it. <coughs> Three members of the Welsh choir from the village, their conductor. In any case, to get back to this other issue about why did I film them essentially as rotating statuary, I did that because for two reasons. One is that it represents or reflects my sense of trauma, human trauma, which is that we, we freeze in response to traumatic events 
but it's never a complete freeze because the forces of life keep moving. You're kind of a moving stillness. And the other reason is because the villagers themselves feel frozen in time. Like the world is looking in at them, like they're floating in plastic. And they're, they are not being given the freedom to breathe and move on because they're always associated with the disaster. Whenever they travel and they say they're from Aberfan, it's always, oh, isn't that the village where da da da? And they find that very painful to feel that. There's ex coal miner on the left. There's the mayor again, the, the, the policeman of the village, the center channel. And I filmed them from di very different points of view. There's the traffic warden. I filmed about 35 villagers. The fish and chips man on the right. It was a very challenging project. Um, in the Q&A, if you want, you can ask some questions about it, but it, um, I have certain rules for myself that I follow when I work with highly traumatized communities, uh, which I spoke quite a bit about in the documentary. Um, sort, of, sort of some do's and don'ts that I follow as religiously as I can. And then here's, I'll let it play to the end now. And remember the subtitle was um, Aberfan, an anatomy of a Welsh village. So there's this kind of recapitulation. They're tiny on your screen, but in the actual installation in the gallery or museum, you know, they're maybe four feet tall each of the characters. But this was this was engaging a community in a you know in a very sort of with a very fraught kind of texture and a community that has been re-injured by the way the outsiders have um, in a way exploited their pain. It was one of the toughest projects I've ever done, I think. And here it ends with the family. And she pops her flash. So again, who is looking at who? And then it ends with a, a uh, dedication. So let's move on. So, okay, so we just sort of pole vaulted um, and we sort of hydroplaned over about 11 years or you know, whatever it was, nine years, 10 years, to a relatively recent piece I, I did called The Crossing. Um, this was a piece I did in Europe uh, with seven Syrian refugees that had recently crossed the Mediterranean on rafts. And they were lucky. They made it to their, they didn't drown. Uh, they were able to leave Syria before the government or the army disappeared them. Um, they made it and they made it to their destination country. So they were, they were lucky. They were among the lucky ones. Now, the invitation that I got to do a project um, it was, it came from one of those small European micro states where the casino industry at one point in time was flourishing. And this was also uh, like a place where like James Bond films were made. And so that was kind of in my mind, you know, okay. Because I like my works to be sort of site and culture specific and body politics specific. But I was, of course, thinking a lot about the issue of Syrian refugees. This is sort of the, the high point of it in Europe uh, in terms of the intensity and the numbers. 
So I had, and my father's family comes from Syria, which in a way was, in a, to, a, to some degree was helpful in terms of establishing a um, initial connection. I know just enough bad word, I know just enough bad broken Arabic to bring a smile. Uh, the piece is called The Crossing. It's eight minutes long. I'm not showing all of it to you. Um, it is filmed in a former gambling casino, which is now a Kunsthalle. And my idea was, I wondered if the casino game of roulette was in any way an apt distillation of the experience of being a refugee in terms of the forces of life and death that are outside of one's control. And I asked them, what did they think of this idea? Did they like the idea? Because if they didn't like it, it wasn't gonna happen. And they said, Shimon, this is what our entire life lives have felt like. Let's do it. So we did the piece. It begins, it, it, um, it, again, there's no digital effects. We model for them how to perform in front of the camera. You might notice that, in, that in some of my, many of my community-based works, the, the facial expressions are very restrained. In, by, by design and by intention. And that's because they also have a right to opacity and to maintain their own interiority. And I also want to interrupt our projections as viewers. We think, oh, we know what a refugee must feel like, or oh, refugee, oh, I feel sympathy or empathy or repulsed or scared or whatever the emotion would be. And I, I don't like to deliver the emotional goods in that way. And I filmed them in somewhat of a robotic way because no one ever flees their country with joy. We often go into automatic pilot just to survive. So I was trying to reflect that going to get loud just for a second. So there's seven, it begins with seven participants and it cycles through seven tableaus. I think we're still in the first tableau. They're young and beautiful, but believe me, they each have horrific stories in their past, the things they told me that are just very hard to absorb. So with each passing tableau, somebody disappears. We don't know why. We don't see them leave the table. Now we have six. We don't know if the person and the, the missing person won, if they lost, we don't know. And here she plays the number 15. The camera sustains there longer than one would expect. It gives us a little bit of extra import. And she played 15 because at that point I asked them um, what would be a good number to play right now? And they said 15. I said, why? And they said, because the Syrian revolution began on April 11th, two, no, excuse me, April 15th, 2011. So the number 15 had. Now we have five left.
and none of the participants had performed in front of a camera ever at, at all before this piece. And some of them had arrived in Europe as recently as about eight weeks prior to the filming. And again, in the Q and A later, you know, feel free to ask how I come into contact with these individuals, how I find them, how I meet them. It's a, sort of an important part of each of these artworks, and it's it's complicated. Now there's two left. Last man sit down. Again, it ends with a dedication for the millions of individuals fleeing the wars in Syria and elsewhere. Individuals who've gambled their futures by making the dangerous journey to Europe in hopes of finding new lives. Seven of these individuals appear in this piece. You know, if, if we had more time, you know, they, they, it, it could lead to an interesting conversation about um, sort of aesthetics and content, like when. When does one, because I could have had the dedication in the beginning, right? But I, ch I often choose to have it at the end um, for different reasons. Um, in any case, sometimes I also explode this piece into being an immersive installation <clears throat> where elements of the film are bled into the space. But to do that, one needs to have resources and um, real estate. This required, I think we had six video projectors on the ceiling in order to do this. This was in a former power station in Germany. <clears throat> now getting much closer to home, Nightwatch, which uh, was recently represented in San Francisco Bay, thanks to the miraculous work of Kathleen Clark and Boxler and, and Immersive Arts Alliance. Um, <clears throat> but, it, but it debuted in New York. Um, and it was a, uh, hold on a second, let me just let, it, I think this does a very good job summarizing it. The floating media installation, a barge pushed by a tugboat. Maybe you can read that. So these were 12 new Americans who live among them. And it's a silent film, 12 video portraits. And it was first presented, as I mentioned, in New York during UN General Assembly. You and of course, and of course, the photographer and the cinematographer and the is very cognizant of that the iconic New York landmark uh, and what they represented as the Statue of Liberty and how that resonated with the with a little clock, 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 clock. And it was a little clock of some distance from the back of the camera. And just look, look at the viewers on the 
I think it was 35 seconds deep, so it looks because cutting to black. You're pretty much fun. And, the, uh, the, uh, and the, the film itself that's on the barge, on the LED screen, this is how it opens with this James Baldwin quote. We contain the other hopelessly and forever. And I'm just gonna show you two, two of the individuals so you can get a better sense of, of the, uh, the tonal values and the aesthetic of how we lit them, how their faces appeared, how they looked into the camera lens. This is a man from Russia. a queer man, which is part of why he fled. Again, very restrained emotionally. I would tell them when you approach the camera, I don't want you to think about something particularly happy and I don't want you to think about something particularly sad. Be neutral. Let the viewer struggle. This is a young woman. She was an unaccompanied minor that was picked up by the border police without her parents. She was from, Hondur from Honduras. This kind of I thou this, this emotionally uninflected I thou encounter. I see you, you see me. I see you, you see me. And then that's how the, the I just showed you two people, but there's 12 in the, in the full film. For the millions who have been forced to flee their homelands, uh, for the fortunate few who have been granted political asylum in the United States, 12 of these individuals appear in this piece. Now, give me a second here. What is, no, 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 no. Uh, in their own words, okay. It's one thing to hear it from me. It's another thing to hear it from them. Give me a second here. Our myths among us. My name is Sergey, and I'm originally from Kazakhstan. My name is Niurka Melendez. I'm here because I fled my country, Venezuela, facing a really bad and worse humanitarian crisis. I arrived from Russia. I was beaten in my country, and I left here, grabbed my son, and left. And let me just fast forward. We don't need to see him. Here we go. Having independent thoughts is a risk. Being target for your own people was the worst thing that I ever faced in my life. Being afraid of my people, being afraid of my own uh, friends because of my thoughts. When I was in Almaty, Kazakhstan, I decided to cover the situation with LGBTQ people. Then I got like threats and emails and several really um, traumatic experiences that I that I'm not comfortable to talk still. I was a witness of a crime and in, into Russian Immigration Social Service. I said, "Okay, okay, guys, I will do whatever you want." And they took uh, my son, jumped to the car, and left. She was a judge in Russia. With all of these projects, including Nightwatch, it takes several months to locate the potential participants, establish relationships, establish trust. When people are, are, come up to a camera lens, they either want to look, they want to smile, uh, they want to reveal a certain emotion. And what I suggested to the participants was let's do it a little different because people, the public thinks they know how you feel. Oh, you had a, you're an asylum seeker. You must have had a very hard life or, oh, I feel sympathy for you. And I said to the participants, 
When you approach the camera, I don't want you to think about anything particularly positive or happy or anything particularly negative or sad. Be kind of in the middle, be neutral, like you're playing a game of poker. You have the right to have your own interiority. I chose deliberately to, to film the subjects in a, in, a, in a lighting that's a bit like old master painting, lighting or, or Car Caravaggio-esque. They would come over to where the monitor was afterwards and look at some rushes. Uh, and no, they loved it because they, we, you know, we, they looked like they were in old master paintings. Uh, and I mean, we got them to look really beautiful. I'm motivated to be a part of this was putting faces where usually numbers are. My hope is for the people. So, so news flash, fast forward two years or so, two and a half years. And this is just a few weeks ago. This is opening night of Night Watch. It was three consecutive evenings. Two of them were at various uh, points along the, on the San Francisco side of the bay. The third night was on the other side. The opening night was a port with the viewing point with Fort Mason. Closely recognized Alcatraz in the Golden Gate Bridge. And just a few still photographs. Um, as with many of my public projects, I also, I often attempt to make images that can, uh, that resonate on their own after the project is, long after the project is over. This is from New York. the end and so i am going to stop share and um before i turn this over to lisa to to um moderate i found the word to moderate a discussion and conversation uh i did want to say two things which is that uh i still uh even though night watch in the bay is over um, I have a exhibition of my work that I'm very proud of and excited by at Catherine Clark Gallery that is still up until October 30th. So I hope some of you might feel moved to go see it. it it's a survey show, so it covers several of my pieces. Uh, and I'm very happy with how it came out. And also the last closing event for Night Watch, because there was, you know, there were dozens of events all over the Bay Area. The last closing event is November 5th at the San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art. Um, <clears throat> it's from five to nine o'clock. They're doing a video screening of some of the video footage from Night Watch in San Francisco Bay, uh, combined with some footage from New York. So. I think without further ado, I'm all yours for questions, com you know, comments, conversation, et cetera. Well, thank you so much. It was such a rich uh, telling of your history and taking us through your journey. And, you know, it's so different having been reading about you and looking at images. It's so different to hear it from you personally. So I just want to thank you so much for being here and sharing with us. And, um, I just have a whole different perspective of your work by having you be here. So, you know, I wanted to pick up on some of the kind of provocations that you brought forward to ask you and start with one that I'm very curious about, which is, you know, what are these 
what are the rules you have for um, working with people, especially from traumatized communities? Because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's really important, especially, you know, here at Berkeley, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, solving problems of our world and um, entering communities to find solutions. And I, I think um, oftentimes there's good intent, but there could be, you know, and also hearing about some of the mistakes you've encountered and you learn from when you enter communities and with, mm -hmm. with you know, good intentions, but um, mm -hmm. what are what are some guiding principles that you, through, through your artistic process that would be informative? Well, I mean, the, you know, that no, there's some, you know, there's, there's some very central ones. One is that I never ever uh, ask about the trauma. Mm. I never lead with that. If they want to speak about it, let them bring it up, and they often do. Mm. But if I lead with questions about it, um, it, it, me, I, it, it's inevitably it's voyeuristic. It's about. I want you to satisfy my curiosity. It's about me, not them. So one of my rules is that I never ask about, I never, I never uh, make leading questions. I don't begin a conversation. I don't lead with questions about mm -hmm. traumatic past or experiences with any, with any of the communities that I've worked with. Now they often come forward and talk to me and tell me stuff, but that's a different matter. Then it's not, a, it's not about, it's coming from them, not mm -hmm. from my, curiosity, my voyeuristic, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, it seems and really central because you're capturing them and to build mm -hmm. that layer of trust there. Yeah, really and it, no, it, it, it's, it's, it's true. <laughs> it takes, you know, I, 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 I often say that I, I grow very big ears mm. in situations. I mm -hmm. don't do that much talking. I do a whole lot of listening. And I try, I try to take up as little space as possible and let them be um, in, in the center. Um, so that's, um, those would be two big ones. Mm -hmm. Doing a lot of listening and never leading with questions about the, a traumatic experience. Um, even though that will often emerge. Come forward. Yeah, from 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 them. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Are there are, are there ways in which you learn to you know obviously the listening, but to develop trust? You talked about you know living within the community for up to six months or maybe longer, or um, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, ways in which you establish trust and and rapport with yeah. the, with the people you're telling stories about, especially since you're, especially if you're coming outside of their not in their community. Right, right. No, I know it's it's a it has a whole set of you know. There's all the stuff you know th these the, these long term conversations about appropriation, right? Mm -hmm. Who has the right to tell whose stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean this is going on. That topic was happening in the '80s when I was in art school, and it's still yeah relevant, right? And it's just sort of interesting because I was saying to the village and to the to the arts council there in the BBC, I was saying, why, 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 why me? Why mm -hmm. not a Welsh artist? Why not a, an artist from that region of Wales? And what came back to me was, no, Shimon, it's precisely because you have some distance mm -hmm. that you can interpret, that there's there's an interpretive space. So and I then they invited you as well, as opposed and they invited to invited me, yes. As opposed to you approaching them. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. They did. They they did more. the the main producer, like the the executive producer of the whole thing, and he was like a, a producer of the BBC. Also, he grew up in the village next door, and on the day of the his mom was a nurse, and on the day of the disaster, she came running into the village and was helping. So he had this whole sort of. He was the bridge initially mm. me in the village. Mm -hmm. But this larger question, you know, you know, for, 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 for many of the students who are um, with us today, you know, is it does relate to, you know, how do you, how do, how do you build trust? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very complicated. Um, sincerity goes a long way. Patience goes a long way. And don't assume anything. 
-hmm. Just don't do not assume anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you know, I said, I said to them, and I, I mentioned this in passing earlier to the, to the villagers, I said, I'm, I make you two promises. I'm not going to use any images from the archive and I'm going to film you in a way you've never been seen before with a kind, I think I said, I think I said something like with a kind of majesty is, mm -hmm. is maybe what, how I said it. And, um, you know, and, and it took time, but they, they did, they did come to trust me. They, they felt they they um they trusted me and maybe yeah. they felt my sincerity with it you know mm -hmm. there was only one member of the village there was only one who she couldn't it, it, there was one she had lost three kids and mm -hmm. she was ne never recovered at all not that one ever does but she was just destroyed kind of and and she couldn't she couldn't um she did not fully come on board but that was one per, you know one one person in the village mm -hmm. so but it's you know it's um generally I, like also with the the syrian refugees for the crossing and the individuals the asylees in night watch i basically i show them examples of my past work and then i tell them what my vision <laughs> vision is for this new piece that i wanted to create that i want to create with them but what my goal is, like, what is my, what is my, you know, what, what, what is my intention? So like with, 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 with the asylees and night watch, I would tell them, you know, people think they know how you feel, but they don't know how you feel. So that's why I don't want to film you in a sentimental way. I want to film you really restrained. And they would listen to me talk and, and they would get into it and they'd say, yeah, Shimon, exactly, exactly. So it like obviously the artist's intention has to align to some extent with the with the desires and experience of the potential participants. So, but this is something we could talk about till we're blue in the face. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. many questions popping up, and we're gonna go back now to your first piece about writing on the walls in right. East Berlin yeah. and a mm -hmm. lot of questions around, you know, um, what mm -hmm. were the response to people living in the buildings and um uh, were the community, uh, let's see, what was the community and residents' response to the slide projections? And also, um, did that piece have any personal meaning for you to to do that in that specific site? Or mm -hmm. what drew you to uh, initially begin that project? So sort of mm -hmm. several mm -hmm. questions around the, the Berlin Wall. Right. Well, and, it's interesting. Let, let me, can I, let me start with the last piece first. Um, you know, it may not be apparent, but I have I have really personal connections to all of my projects. Mm. You know, yeah. Okay. My great. grandfather, my grandfather was from Germany. Um, I'm Jewish, but my grandfather, mm -hmm. my my mother's father was was German Jew. Um, we don't know if he was specifically from Berlin or not. Uh, all four of my grandparents traveled through the Lower East Side. When they immigrated to New York, they had their year to America. I mean, they had their years in the Lower East Side. Uh, the crossing, my father's family is from Syria, but these things get, you know, again, the, the whole, this whole, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, there's the whole um, conversation again about who can speak for whom. And in my heart and soul, I feel that. Um, for example, just because my dad's family was from Syria doesn't give me any more or any less right to speak about the trauma of being an, a refugee. That it's ultimately really about a shared common humanity. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I say, sometimes I say certain things being in a slightly defensive crouch because again, the, the debates around appropriation. Um, you know, it, 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 well, I don't want to get into a, 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 I don't want to get into a long foray about, about sort of making a, issues related to making a better world, as the Jews say, tikkun olam, which are kind of universal. They're not, they're not like specific, like, oh, one group is, you know, God, I care about the human rights of one group, but not another group. No, that's not the way it works. Um, but going back to the other part of the question, what I might do is, um, can I go back to screen, uh, share screen for a second? Yeah. 
because it's better to see an image while I'm talking. Mm -hmm. okay, let's just do this again. Okay. Give me a second. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. For example, this, this projection <coughs> of a former Hebrew bookstore. I have two wild stories to tell about this one. I did it for two consecutive nights. The first night, <coughs> excuse my cough. The first night um, I was doing the, uh, that projection. I happened to be there just by chance that night with German television, the night, nightly news program, Tagus Tamen, which was sort of following me around at some point. I say that for a reason. Um, <coughs> so what happened is during the projection, that door opens and this fellow comes out. You know, at that time he was significantly older than me. He sees the projection on the building. He turns to me and he, you know, he's, he, he turns, he gets red, you know, he's like angry and he runs across the street towards me and the film crew and they, and they just put the microphone right in front of him, he didn't care. And he said in German, uh, I'm gonna get this right. My father bought this house fair and square from Mr. Jacob in 1938. And I was just sort of like taking it back. I, it, was, it, it was all happening so fast, I didn't quite understand. And then he, uh, he repeated it a second time. And then I pulled myself together and said, oh, do you know what happened to this Mr. Jacob after 1938? <clears throat> and he said, why, of course, Abba Natrich, why, of course, he was a multimillionaire and moved to New York as if that was the fate of the Jew, the inevitable uh, fate of the Jews that lived in this neighborhood. That was not their fate and they were not multimillionaires. Um, this, was a, <clears throat> this was Russian and Polish um, Jewish immigrants in this neighborhood, they were poor. So here I am as an artist working in the realm of the imaginary <coughs> and he was he was taking my installations as a literal threat. Like I was trying to repossess um, the, ha the house on behalf of an ancestor, I suppose. So that for me was a very interesting collision. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Collision between artistic yeah. intervention and um, sort of social political uh, yeah, and the multiplicity of communities involved. You've got right. the pers your personal connection and the communities involved from the past, but also the current residents. And, there, and there was a lot going on. There was a lot going on in East Berlin at that time. This is shortly after right, the, the big yeah. shift. The unemployment rate was very, very high. So there was a, a whole lot of things happening. I'll just finish with that saying the second night, which was really interesting, same projection. A a one of those windows on top opens up. A very, very a senior woman, very old woman, <clears throat> opens the window, cocks her head out, looks down, sees the projection, looks up, sees me across the street, and says, no, no, no. But not in a, it wasn't in an aggressive tone. It's just, no, and I, and I ignored her. I just kept working. And then she said it a second time. She said, no, no, no. And I looked up at her from across the street and I said, what do you mean no, no, no? And she says, it was one meter to the right. I remember. Mm. <clears throat> so she lived in the building when that Hebrew bookstore was there. So I found that to be very interesting. Wow. <laughs> did, you, did you process the work with the community after the projections or or was this early in your it career and you weren't yeah it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't that i'm going to stop the screen share yeah it wasn't that type of a project i would never describe mm -hmm. that as a community based project mm -hmm. except for the one exception would be the extent to which many of the archival photographs that i gathered were or let's say some of them were from private 
<clears throat> private collections of families. Most of them though were from like public archives or press mm. archives. So that project, I would never describe it as being community-based. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. yes. It was more almost like a, a putting together a sense of memory, uh, perhaps for personal or um, yeah, for an intention of, uh, of trying to just see the layers of, of excavating a history or something like that, or the, did it have an intention to, to it yes, or was it? Of course, it, of course mm -hmm. the intention was very simple <laughs> for me, which was, um, you know, I had arrived in Berlin, like, you know, shortly after getting my MFA and I knew nothing about the history of this neighborhood, not zero, but I was very drawn to it. And I would walk the streets and I just felt, um, you know, it was, there was something intense there. I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then when I found out that it had been a, it had been a Jewish neighborhood, I was very um, dented by that, I would say. So that project grew out of the gap between what I felt, but what I could not see. Mm. I couldn't see mm. any of the vestiges of this lost community, but I felt something. So, and I couldn't take my finger off that point. Feeling. Yeah, so that's okay. what motivated that project. Great. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna move on to another question from sure. uh, Jessica Velasco. Uh -huh. um, about uh, with the subject of fleeting immigrants, um, how were you able to find participants? Mm -hmm. Were there certain strategies that you employed or certain uh, standards that you had when curating the participants? Well, those are kind of two very- Yeah, two different questions uh, going on in there. Mm -hmm. um, the first part I'll take, I'll start with the first part. Um, mm -hmm. Every project is different. I usually have people helping me, like <clears throat> if I'm lucky, like a producing organization. Mm -hmm. So I'm not totally on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, so we together, we will identify who might be good partners, who might be good partner, part, partnering organizations, advocacy organizations, Mm -hmm. that work with a community that I'm interested in working with and they might have access to these individuals um, and we kind of go that route. I, we, I, I, I come to know some of the organizations, I meet with them, I show them my past work, I tell them what I'm thinking, what I'd like to do. They hopefully get excited and then they bring me in contact with what they would call their clients. Um, they're, they're, you know, whether, whether it's refugees, asylees, et cetera. But it's not always like that. The crossing with the seven Syrian refugees, I had no, there was no, there was no real producing organization in that sense. I mean, I, I, I had an, it was like an invitation to make a project and I was given a budget and that was that. I was on my own. And did you use social networks or advertisements no, no, or friends or? Community, family, family ties, or? No, no, I, oh, that's a good, no, no. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was advised that to not go through governmental organizations because they would, are too slow mm -hmm. and bureaucratic. So people had suggested to me that I go to like um, grassroots, like self-help grassroots refugee organizations. So I did that. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to these, these organizations and going to their meetings. And then, <clears throat> and then um, sometimes somebody would say to me beforehand, oh, go to this meeting and there's, uh, see if you can meet, like, see if you can meet Noor. She studied graphic arts in Damascus. And maybe she would be interested in doing something a little more artistic. So I'd, I'd kind of go there, well, where's Noor? <laughs> and then finally she wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then it's a little crazy, like, oh, I'm this artist from New York. I was invited to do a project. I want to do, work with Syrian refugees. You know, the whole thing can be a little bit, you know, it's kind of can be sound a little out there. Um, and can we meet another time? Can I make an appointment with you, take you to coffee and tell you a little bit what I'm thinking about? And then sort of step by step. That usually takes two or three months. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, that, in that project it did, but in general, 
in general, you could say, I think the community engagement part typically is like three to four months. Then it, that project was quicker because I, I could only be in that country for three months. I mean, that, I had to get it done, the whole project. Yeah, there's some questions coming up too, you know, about, well, first of all, how the participants respond when they see it, but also questions about, uh -huh. you know, um, because these artworks are sold and there's exchange of monies and how, sure. is there a compensation or ways in which... Um, For the participants? The participants. Um, yeah, what is sort of there after the artwork's been made or created or sold? Yeah. Is there ways in which... Oh, that no, it's a very good question. Resources come back to the community or the people. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. It's um, uh, it's it's also current. My current project is in Pennsylvania in Bethlehem, mm. and mm. we're actually we're actually discussing this issue right now. You know, of of compensation. Um, I'll be honest and tell you that for for the first twenty years of doing community gate based projects, uh, compensation never came up. Mm at all it, the the um not to sound corny but the um the intrinsic value of either helping to change how your community is represented or seen by others or being given a voice um or being seen in a new way people were into it for that reason. So mm -hmm. like the Welsh project, probably if they had been offered compensation, they would have been insulted. Um, and- Cause it's almost part of a, 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 right, a way of processing a, a traumatic incident as opposed right, to- Right, that, there, that there's a kind of a, it's a more of a, to have a meaningful experience, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's the so-called compensation in quotation marks. But it's but it has shifted, you know, it has shifted. And so the last seven years, um, people are usually compensated. And mm -hmm. that really began with um, no, that was one in 2011 where they were compensated also. Number one, if it's professional actors, dancers, performers, they already have a, it's kind of already mm -hmm. like their skill or their craft, there's that issue. Is so that they're going to be compensated? But there was lots of discussions. Anytime that I've worked with refugee or asylee communities in particular, compensation is very important in that arena. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who are struggling just to live, right? Or pay their rent. Okay, so their time and their effort to come. Yeah, so they are, they are compensated, but it's tricky. Mm -hmm. Even then, like I, you know, I hold it back in terms of discussing it. I say it at the end of like a conversation, not at the beginning, because it's the wrong reason to do the project. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that, that can be like an icing on the cake reason, but it, it's, it shouldn't be like the main motivator. But there is compensation now. Almost, almost every project I do, something shifted. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Uh, Waverly Toy in the question and answer says, "When being tasked with representing stories with so many levels, where do you uh, do you ever struggle uh, with where to begin?" And I would love to hear more about your creative process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I often struggle about where to begin. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I interpret that question to mean, I mean, I, I translate it for myself to mean, um, because where I, be, well, let me just, where I begin is usually trying to develop a concept. Basically, what do I wanna do? Mm -hmm. And that's, for me, that's the hardest part. Once I know what I wanna do, then it's a matter of execution and realization. But if I don't even know what I wanna say, I am in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. So, so typically I begin with many months of research of every kind. It could, they, it could be walking the streets of a location. It could be speaking to as many people as I can. It could be reading five books on a certain topic. It could be daydreaming about a topic. And it's like a soup. And if I'm lucky, 
you know, after a few, usually, usually it takes a few months. Sometimes I've been lucky and it's more like a bolt of lightning hitting me. But they kind of strikes me. Yeah, but usually it takes a few months and then, then a concept will emerge. Something will get distilled. So, you know, something will get, you know, because it is, it often is, well, how do I, how do I, what is the right gesture that distills a whole array of like what the question she mentioned of all these levels of, or layers. Mm -hmm. Right. So many How can you engage all of that in a very compacted way, in a very distilled way? And that's, you know, that's part of the challenge of being an artist, because that's, mm -hmm. that, that's not easy. Do you keep journals? Do you yeah. speak into a, your phone? Do you um, do all that tell stories stuff. to people? Do you draw? Yeah. Do you... No, I do. Mm -hmm. I do. You have a variety of tactics. I do. It's basically, in other words, it's, it's, it's very messy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, in our last few minutes, I thought I'd ask one mm -hmm. more, and this is mm -hmm. kind of a looking back. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and since uh, we're looking back at Nightwatch, um, do you hear, this is from Ari Louie, do you hear from past participants in your work um, mm -hmm. how being part of the project impacted their lives after the exhibition ended? So, you know, those participants, um, mm -hmm. do they reflect? back are you in contact with them mm -hmm. uh, what's it like to have the work presented you know in another city so what's it like just right. kind of thinking back and reflecting um i do and hear especially back. from them yeah right i do i do hear back from them um for example in the crossing and i knew this was going to happen i just knew it so no one none of the seven they didn't know each other <clears throat> and i had this hunch these two are going to fall in love and they fell in love they got married they had children now and they met through the crossing which through participating in the art which, which was really fun and then they went on was it those two or was it oh yeah it, yes it was those two then they went on to do do acting oh. uh in that country in theater uh, uh on the on the topic of being you know, re refugee issues, but they were performing in, in, a, in the theater in the main, in the capital of that country, um, <clears throat> which was very interesting to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so the answer is yes, but I mean, I'm not in constant touch with everybody. I mean, it's, you know, we all have full lives and busy lives and, you know, I'm onto another project, they're onto another project, but I, um, uh, Yes, but there are often very nice sort of meaningful intersections that occur later where mm -hmm. they send me a message on Facebook or an email, you know, hey, Shimon, what's going on? And um, so it's a very, it's a, it is a very good question because, the, you know, it, it, it kind of comes down to that old, that old nagging question of like the power of art and the limitations of art. Mm. And the effect of art and how long lasting is it and and what kinds of changes does art cannot can art facilitate uh and these are very big questions yeah have you heard back that it did or or didn't create change like specifically or like well, has, I, knew has an art piece? Welsh, I knew with the welsh project it it totally did um, it did have impact on their community yeah yeah, mm -hmm. no, it was very, it, it was very, um, first of all, they had an experience with an outsider who kept his word, you know, mm. I'm not saying that to, I'm not saying that to valorize myself. It's more, that's how they saw it. Um, so that was one thing, but the, the, um, <clears throat> the opening night at the museum, the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff, which, which, which is where the piece premiered. There were several buses that were chartered and came down from the village to the opening at the museum. So I don't know how many villagers came, let's say 300, I don't know. So we, so the piece opened the video 20 minutes long, there was absolute silence in the room, absolute silence. Mm -hmm. 
And, and then when the piece ended, then there was like a, a, a round of applause. And the curators said they had never, ever, ever seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I could recommend um, I, the, the, the documentary, I think, mm. speak, that the BBC made, it's, call, it's called, it's, they were trying to be funny, I think. It's called An American, an American in Aberfan, um, playing off of An American in Paris. And um, I think that it's, it, it's, a, it's good, it's a good film. And I think it does, it does, um, um, it does kind of speak to some of the, the, the power of that piece for the individuals. But I know we're running out of time. I'll just say one, yeah. I'll just, I'm just gonna say one last thing on this topic, which is from a totally different angle. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that does happen quite often, and this isn't necessarily specifically from um, community-based projects per se, although it can include those. But like I very often will run into people who say, hey, Shimon, I remember your projections in Berlin when I lived there. And every time I cross this building, I, I see the projection. I remember it being there. Uh, or this big underwater piece I did in Copenhagen that I, I, didn't, I didn't show because you can't show everything. I didn't show, I didn't show tonight. Where people will remember my underwater installation in Copenhagen in the, in the 90s. So that's a totally different thing, but, but that's just fun how mm -hmm. The image, how images, the power of images. Yeah, and, the power of image. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very interesting. So. Yeah, and the power to change, you know, the how our memories are now, they're finding out are so constructed so that you're actually creating layers <laughs> for people, uh, how, they, how they remember things too, because you're kind of implanting new memories and, and it's already based on the layers of your kind of research and archiving, especially in the writing on the projections on the walls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you so much for this very enlightening talk tonight. And it was really a pleasure to get to know you better and to get your get to know your work better. And I feel like we could just talk online about your art making. So um, but I know it's getting late for people. So thank you everyone for coming. And I wish you could uh, hear everyone. Give you an applause. It's very awkward how we have to end these. It just kind of goes off and we can't, uh, you know, right. have a moment. But um, thank you so much, Shimon. Thank you for having me. Yeah, have, have a, a lovely evening. Good evening, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.